Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar series designed for and by the Critical Materials Innovation Hub. I'm Cynthia Howell, and I'm the Education Workforce Development Manager and for CMI. And today I'm going to be your moderator. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, how we're running the webinar today. These webinars are hosted by Colorado School of Mines. We are always looking for topics that will serve our CMI body. So if you have any ideas, um, please don't hesitate to put it on the survey or email us at CMI at mines.org. EDU. It is a public webinar. A recording is going to be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI. Under the webinar menu and also on our YouTube channel, the Criticals Innovation Hub channel. Um, questions, we are going to ask you to save those to the very end. We're going to save them to the very end. But when you do have a question, please don't hesitate to write it down so that we'll be queued up. And, uh, and then we will begin. I'd like to take a moment to uh, introduce our uh, webinar presenter. And uh, today we have... Dr. Aaron Wilson. He's a research chemist with over 20 years of experience across industry, academics, and government laboratories. Um, he uh, started at Idaho National Lab at 2010, and since then he has been an active principal investigator and is the current chemical separations group lead. Um, he has his, his PhD is from the University of Colorado Boulder, and uh, he has received a lot of awards on his research, and in, in, in particular, three R&D 100 awards. And we're going to get to hear about one of those today. So, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind taking away the uh, webinar here. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks. I'll uh, get my mouse into the right environment. So, yeah. So, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, is... One, so we had three scenarios in our RD 100 application, three kind of feeds of interest. We had agricultural wastewater, we had mining, uh, mining waters uh, of various sorts, and then we had seawater mining. And um, I haven't presented this to this audience, so I think we're gonna so we're gonna look at the uh, seawater mining in this talk. And so the mineral recovery in the blue economy is kind of the example that we'll be working through. But but it's worth reviewing uh, just the importance of minerals to a net zero carbon uh, economy. So it, basically, as we trans transition away from fossil fuels, uh, the collection, storage, and utilization of energy is all going to rely, <clears throat> rely on a minerally produced materials and systems, whether they're batteries, reactors, solar panels, wind turbines, it's, they're all based off of uh, basically more advanced mineral uh, products than what we now use in our current infrastructure. And so one of our major targets is uh, better production, processing, and recycling of those minerals. And if we're successful at that, the outcome will be lower cost for our energy inter infrastructure uh, that can be more equitably uh, distributed and a more secure ener energy infrastructure where we don't have to worry about um, gas prices going up and down at the consumer level or at the industrial level. And so more, more energy security is more security for many industries. And, uh, and so that, that's, the, that's the success if, if we are able to achieve it. And so here's a cartoon I like to use to describe kind of what we're approaching. And, and a lot of people don't understand the processing of primary resource or is similar to recycling, e-waste, bat including batteries. And it's, it involves collecting and then crushing and physically separating materials um, and then doing additional separations, whether it's through a hydrometallurgical or hydrometallurgical pathway. Um, uh, to, to liberate, well, first you liberate the, the minerals you're targeting, then you do separations, um, and then you convert it back into a metallized product or uh, an uh, oxide or a salt. And, and these can be considered solid-solid separations, followed by a solid-to-liquid liberation and a liquid-liquid separation, 
followed by it's liquid liquid separations to get to the material you want, followed by a liquid to solid to your ultimate product, unless you can use a liquid product. In these steps, we put in a lot of mechanical energy to get things moved around and physically separated. And then we put in a lot of water and chemicals for the liberation and the separation of individual ions that we're interested in. And then we'll use thermal and electrical energy to get back to um, target products. And this produces uh, byproducts, either tailings or other solid wastes and complex uh, chemical wastes from the separation products. Uh, it's interesting. Brines are a way to bypass a number of these of these wastes and, and are interesting for a variety of reason, reasons, whether you're collecting continental brines for lithium or potash or magnesium products for uh, directly from the ocean or actually doing in situ mining uh, for the production of something like uranium. Um, we're interested in this space because um, we want to make sure that minerals are produced uh, around the world in, in um, including domestic sources. And right now, many of the critical materials, while they're mined in various port places around the world, they're almost all processed in China. Uh, and so if we can improve um, the separations and the leaching and, and the conversion processes, we can get to the point where people feel comfortable with critical materials and other mineral production domestically. And, and this means improving our water management uh, in many processes. Um, the cost of, of leaks as well as catastrophic failures can be significant. And this, this is a problem that extends beyond uh, critical materials. This, this is Brazil's largest mine failure involving an iron mine in, in 2015. Um, and the impact, if we're successful at this, is uh, is is significant in a number of dimensions. Um, one thing that I like to point out is people often talk about electric vehicles as being heavier. If you're comparing across classes, that's true. But if you actually compare within a class, so you compare a high performance small SUV to another high performance small SUV, um, the the battery, uh, the electric vehicle, the battery powered vehicle is actually generally lighter. There's only a few examples where. Um, the electric vehicle is actually heavier than the corresponding um, corresponding internal combustion engine car. Here I have the Tesla Y and the Audi Q7 up here. And the only ones where the internal combustion engine would be lighter is where they have significantly less horsepower. One thing to note in this is, is this can represent, uh, assuming that electric vehicles can lower their cost, um, their annual cost to operate will be significantly less. Ballpark um, uh, fifteen dollars to $28,000 over the lifetime of the vehicle, depending on the cost of gasoline, uh, averaging about $2,000 to $3,000 a year for uh, an individual consumer. But it also means a 10 times reduction in the mass delivered to a consumer because they just have to receive the electric vehicle. The electricity doesn't come directly to them. Um, in terms of physical objects, it's, it's, it's through the grid uh, or through their residential uh, solar, solar collection. Um, and there's a long history of, of minerals and um, the Department of Energy in, in terms of minerals and power. So the, during World War II, uh, the largest aluminum plant was actually in Tennessee and uh, co-located with the Tennessee Valley Authority. And that was part of the war effort in, in the production of aircraft. And in, it was also uh, one of the reasons for locating Oak Ridge where it is today, was the accessibility to uh, affordable and large amounts of power, which then led um, in, to many things, including the development of commercial nuclear power, including EBR-1, out here at Idaho National Laboratory, which then has a feedback of ending up producing nuclear power plants for the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's, 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 a, it's a great story. Um, and, and so now we're looking at what else can be done in this kind of energy water nexus. Uh, 
one of the challenges with desalination, which is 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 which is a slide. I should have a slide on desalination, but desalination is has been dropping in cost over the past forty years, and it's a, basically approaching a thermodynamic minimum where it won't cost any less than it, it than it does today. And so people are looking for how they can have seawater for freshwater more, how they can access freshwater from seawater more cost effectively. And they're actually looking at expanding the problem. They're looking at what can they get out of that seawater to make the water itself more cost effective. On the left, this is uh, a, a figure from a paper out of SWIC, uh, the Saudi desalination firm, which desalinates about 20% of the seawater globally. And it has a concentration of minerals in that can be produced from seawater on the x-axis and on the y-axis has the value of those minerals. And, and then they have these diagonal lines and the perpendicular offset of these diagonal lines is a representation of how accessible that value is in seawater. It also happens to be if you multiply the x-axis by the y-axis, it, it becomes the value of minerals in a ton of the seawater or a unit mass of seawater. Here I've has plotted as a ton. And it shows that the water has value. But in fact, the water is not the most valuable portion of the seawater. It, you have the sodium chloride projects. I have the sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride listed here. You could also have hydrochloric acid. The, the challenge with these products is the regional local products. You can easily flood the market, which would drastically change their value. However, Magnesium is a global commodity and it has significant value and, and it basically is a drop in replacement for aluminum. And as a result, you could, uh, we are producing about a million tons of magnesium a year right now. We produce about 70 million tons of aluminum. And, uh, and, and there's many reasons to transition from aluminum to magnesium. It's about two thirds the mass, so it's 33% lighter. It has, it's amongst the highest specific strength of any material. It's actually easier to recycle and recycle than aluminum and much easier than titanium or carbon fiber. It's easier to work um, than carbon fiber, which is one of the major reasons we haven't seen carbon fiber replace materials more widespread in like the auto industry and whatnot. It, it actually is very labor intensive and relies on low paid uh, employees to make um, materials out of carbon fiber, given today's methodology. Um, magnesium can be produced from many sources, mineral as well as seawater. Historically, it was produced from seawater, um, and it has a stable value. It will likely be uh, between $2 and $7 um, uh, moving forward. Uh, the ratio of the cost of aluminum to the cost of magnesium is a, a, a key uh, economic uh, point. So you can imagine a blue economy where you have you have sources of power, uh, you have RO desalination, which is supplying residential and agricultural and industrial needs. And then out of this RO desal, you're producing magnesium going to a magnesium production industry that uh, that has additional value and offsets the cost of the water. And this is an interesting, uh, interesting target for power production. And going back to this interrelationship between uh, the energy, water, uh, energy, water, water, energy nexus, um, in which the cost to produce desalinated water is actually small. This is uh, 70 million tons of water per year, which is the Carlsbad desalination plant. This is modeled after that in near San Diego, California. It takes about 30 megawatts, which is actually a very small amount, like 5% of a coal-fired power plant, something on that order of magnitude, uh, to produce that water. But if we expand that into the production of magnesium, it takes at least 20 times the energy to produce magnesium, which greatly expands the problem and makes it attractive for a synergistic relationship between energy production and um, in product production and, and added value. And it goes from water being an infrastructure cost to being a byproduct of a mineral recovery industry. And it consumes both thermal and electrical energy, which is um, 
which is a benefit to uh, many of the concerns that are hitting the grid now and how to maximize the value of the existing grid structure as we electrify the existing grid structure. Now, now for our technology. So, and this is kind of a, a high level overview of um, why, why our R&D 100 technology is of interest in this space. So we have seawater coming in and it's emerged that nanofiltration, ENA, is emerging as the state-of-the-art treatment, pretreatment of seawater prior to seawater reverse osmosis, SWRO. And it had been ultrafiltration in this stuff. But the neat thing about nanofiltration is it creates a divalent stream of, of, of ions coming out of this process. And our technology, dimethyl ether driven fractional crystallization, DMEFC, can directly precipitate those out as solids without doing an evaporative crystallization stuff or going through uh, pH swings that would consume chemicals and produce byproducts. Um, so we get directly to valuable materials. Now, the seawater RO process produces fresh water and, and then a concentrated brine output. That concentrated brine output can actually go to uh, developing RO technologies, which go by a series of different acronyms. One of them is osmotically assisted reverse osmosis, OARO, and that can take them up to 20,000 PDS or higher, which is three times um, uh, and it's actually six times seawater concentrations, three times the RO brine concentrate, at which point we can apply our DME driven water extraction technology to take those to solids and get access to the sodium products or the potassium products, many of which are fertilizers. And this is this is kind of where our technology falls. It, it is a way to take things from solution and pre produce solid solid products out of them. And the established ways of doing that these days are evaporative techniques. There's multiples, multiples of these. And you apply energy, you produce weight, vapor, and a concentrate, or you go all the way to everything being solid. Uh, these processes are ballpark 5% efficient. They are extremely expensive. They have high capital cost. I'll go through that a little bit in a minute. And um, and the other way to do it is chemical precipitation. You can develop flow sheets where some of these chemicals are required, recycled in the process, but it adds complexity and it generally produces additional waste byproduct in addition to consuming chemicals. And so um, there are drawbacks to that. Now with dimethyl ether fractional crystallization and zero liquid discharge through water extraction, we recycle our, our chemical in the process directly. We produce solids, uh, products, and a depleted solution. Depending on what we're doing, the solution is 99.95% free of the, the solid thin solution, or it's a very low energy effort to get to the solid products. Um, here's the fractional crystallization pathway. Here we start with 100 mils of some solution. We add dimethyl ether to that, um, either a small amount up to 50 grams, and we produce a solution rich in dimethyl ether. It's a, a condensable gas that is highly water soluble. So it will become a, a 33, basically 33 per weight percent solution. A third of it will be dimethyl ether, at which point minerals will precipitate out of these. And we were actually really surprised by the levels of recovery, recovery we could get through this process. We got up to 98% recovery of minerals, but they actually vary. And, and the variance between the recovery rates actually gives us a selectivity, separation factor, selectivity between minerals. And we, we were able to get high purities of some minerals up to 99.9% purity. And we end up with a, a depleted uh, solution. And so an important part of this dimethyl ether is within 10 minutes, we have demonstrated that we can get down to 20 parts per million dimethyl ether, which is a 99.9% nine, nine, five percent recovery of dimethyl ether, which is what makes this possible. People have been looking at these solvent-driven processes for a long time, but it's really the recycling of the solvent that has always been challenging. And uh, alternatively, instead of just putting the dimethyl ether into the water, we can actually 
um, pull water into the organic phase. And most minerals are actually all but the very, all but organic, some organic, not all organic, some organic ions are excluded from this. Generally, it's about 99.9% .9 rejection and uh, as solids. And But here, we need to use a lot more dimethyl ether. So we use about 150 grams to 10 mils water to pull about 8% of the water into our organic phase, um, at which point we separate the organic phase from the solids and then, again, recycle the DME, and that's how the process works. And, and as I was saying, it is the recycling of the DME that is the key strength here. And this is a perspective we, we put together on um, solvent-driven aqueous separations um, where the solvents used directly to either uh, cause precipitation or move water rather than conventional solvent extraction where ions are moved through the organic phase with ligands. Here we're moving the water through the organic phase and either doing a temperature swing uh, with the left side to, to separate the water from the organic or doing um, a volatile vaporizing the organic instead of vaporizing the water to separate the organic. And here it shows dimethyl ether's special feature. It is, um, it has a very low enthalpy of vaporization and a high relative volatility. There's actually only like five, between 400 and 500 uh, condensable gases. So you can go through these one at a time and see that it has a, it has unique, uh, unique characteristics in terms of its uh, non-reactivity while still having the right um, hydrophilicity uh, and, and low enthalpy to drive processes like this. Um, very happy with how this paper turned out. We got the cover in chemistry. It was exciting. So we've been able to demonstrate separations for a variety of materials, including battery materials down in the left corner, um, uh, or magnet materials in the left corner, battery materials in the nickel sulfate. The cobalt sulfate's actually uh, from a cobalt summary magnet. So it's, um, again, magnet materials. We can do ZLD. This is with sodium chloride. We can soften material. This is calcium sulfate, a, a, a consistent challenge for hardness uh, because lime softening does not remove it all. And then we can actually produce solids from slurries. This is some magnesium hydroxide. And we have really interesting selectivity. I mentioned that we have um, that we can get selective materials out, but we can actually switch between which materials we're getting out of the same mother liquor um, through a variety of handles, including temperature. Here's an example of starting from the same starting point. If we do this at 20 degrees, we get 99.5% transition metal product. So that's the cobalt and iron product. If we actually go up to 31 degrees, we go up to 99.4% Samarian product. And, it, and this is driven by the mineral, um, the mineral stability. But it's really exciting to see that we can go back and forth like this, uh, starting from this, the same starting point and drive selectivity. Um, during evaporative processes, you can do mechanical vapor compression, evaporative processes, and control the temperature. Um, but it is more challenging to control the temperature in those processes than it is for us. All we do is add the DME and, uh, and moderate, modulate the temperature through, um, through any, any standard uh, heat exchange or heat control system. Uh, it works really effectively. And down in the bottom, we show that we are able to produce um, neodymium magnet products as well. And, and again, this is driven by uh, in this case, uh, retrograde stability, retrograde, retrograde solubility of the lanthanides versus conventional um, solubility of the transition metal sulfates, which just get more soluble as temperature goes. Um, another thing that was really exciting for us is we're able to pull um, minerals out of a negative pH solution, very acidic solution, and we're able to create products. We actually were highly concerned the acidity would prevent um, prevent us from accessing um, minerals out of out of acidic solutions, and this is important because out of a solvent extraction process or an ion exchange process or a leaching process, all three of those systems are going to be spitting out acidic solutions, and we'll be able to participate in uh, processing minerals directly after those steps while avoiding any need to do 
um, do a pH adjustment, which means that the, the solution will capture the solids and the solutions coming off of those are that much more likely to be able to go right back to the process they came from and be used in it. And we won't be producing additional brine uh, that will need to be sent to a chloralkali plant like they're doing the mass non pass mine. Um, we that in this example, in this example, we're actually uh, using the fractional crystallization process. So we're recovering uh, 90, um, like 85 to 90 percent of the mineral, but we can do 100 percent recovery of the minerals and actually produce purified water if that's the target as well. And this, we use a slightly more complex system. I'll show a picture of it in a moment to, um, to take the water from being a TDS of 23,000 parts per million down to a TDS of 8.1 parts per million and, uh, and produce a solid product um, that, is, that is very interesting. We can uh, produce solids out of slurries. We, within uh, less than 20 minutes, we still have to establish exactly how long it takes. We were able to produce 99% dry magnesium hydroxide. And we can do this for other slurries, as well as things that are sent, sent to um, um, waste ponds at this point and reduce the cost, change the dynamic of sending material to waste ponds. There's a rule of thumb. It takes 10 cents per ton to send it to waste pond, but $10 to actually dry it out for dry storage. And, so if we can change that from ten cents to one dollar, uh, which is not unrealistic, the economics of that change. And then if we take, if people take into account the costs of of plant failures, which were we were seeing increasingly, and we there the cost of that is continually being adjusted as they happen. It may become increasingly interesting to take. Uh, these wastes to dryness, and in the process, actually access minerals that are in those, the, what is currently considered wastes, um, which is what our current critical materials project is about, um, accessing more minerals from those wastes. Now, we we were able to um, be an R&D 100 winner, and a big part of that, there's three things that go into winning R&D 100 at least from my perspective. This is after, I've, we've won three of them so far. Um, it's really important that you frame your challenge in a way that reaches a broad audience because your audience, your reviewers are not specialists. They don't understand the difference between ion exchange and, um, and lime softening or ion exchange and solvent extraction. It's, these aren't on their radar. Uh, so you need to frame it in a way that a lot of people can understand. And then you need to do a one-to-one -one comparison uh, is, is really valuable. And then finally, a, uh, getting letters of support is really important. And so um, we were able to get letters of support from two of our licensees. We have two licensees with different fields of, of interest, um, different fields of, of, uh, of use for this technology. Um, and they were able to write letters of support as well as industrial partners of theirs that are lo looking at commercializing this technology and implementing it kind of the end user of the technology. And so with these letters, it was a, a real a real driver for us being successful. Um, and uh, this, I, I should have put this earlier, but this, this goes along with the one-to-one -one comparison that I was talking about. So our DME driven processes, both the fractionalization as well as water extraction, compete with crystallizers. Um, and crystallizers are both energy intensive, they have 5% efficiency and the cost of evaporating water is high. So they're energy hogs, but they're also uh, capital intensive for two reasons that they are, you have to use high grade material that are resistant to um, to high salty environments. So it's these are high grade alloys in these materials. And they also are more effective as you increase their size. So there's a strong driver to make these large, which makes it difficult to scale systems. It makes you want to centralize system. You can't do distributed operation. And uh, this is this is a 
evaporative crystallizers actually intended for battery recycling at, at a uh, industrial operator in the United States. And it came, it, it was shipped in and uh, had a long process getting to its target location. Uh, so yeah, so it, here we do a one-to-one -one comparison between uh, evaporation ponds, thermal concentration, and evaporative crystallizer. And, and then finally, a process where evaporative crystallizer is evaporative crystallization is used to purify salts versus fractional crystallization using purified salts. And so we're lower cost using DME for the concentration step, but then we're extremely, we're much lower, or order of magnitude lower once we're into the purification cycle. And it's really exciting because it opens up new purification pathways uh, and they can also drop into existing product uh, purification flow sheets. And, and we wanna get to the point where um, people can consider going, well, maybe we'll try the any fractional crystallization or purification process here. Now, that was all done with mechanical vapor compression cycles as our, our process. Um, we And DME is more processing to recycle through mechanical vapor compression, so a fully electric process. Um, it's a DME's higher pressure. Um, we don't use to ha you have to use high grade materials. Uh, it's higher it's higher pressure and higher density. So and it should be more effective at NBC than water. So we looked at that. The main advantage is that it can be fully electric. Now, more recently in a paper that is submitted, we looked at using a multi-effect distillation. Now, multi-effect is the most competitive uh, distillation technology, desalination technology outside of reverse osmosis. And it looks like um, DME recovery through a multi-effect uh, style system comes in very close to water treatment through multi-effect distillation. But instead of reaching a high concentration, we can actually go all the way to zero liquid discharge. So this is really exciting um, because the crystallizer technologies are another order of magnitude more expensive than multi-effect distillation. So, um, so we're we're working through the uh, cost of these processes. This is, um, and and we're scaling them up. And so this is kind of our hood scale system where we're doing uh, modified one of our DME handling systems for DME water extraction for D DME ZLD. We're looking at what um, a larger scale experimental system would look like. We're working with industrial partners to make this happen. And these are going into our C1, D1 facility, our class one, division one uh, uh, room is basically uh, designed for handling flammable gases. Dimethyl ether is, um, is, is I, there's always needs to be a disclosure on dimethyl ether. It's categorized as a peroxide forming chemical. However, uh, there have been experiments where it's been compressed with air, dimethyl ether, and water, and it doesn't actually form peroxides. The theoretical explanation for that is the methyl radical is much less stable than an ethyl or a longer radical, which doesn't allow the pathway to exist. Second, uh, even without that, it's much likely less, it's much less likely to get oxygen in contact with dimethyl ether since it's a pressurized gas. And so uh, it would be just more difficult to get oxygen introduced. Um, so it's a peroxide former, it's classified as one, but it's simply because it's an ether. Um, that leaves that it's a flammable, flamm flammable, eh, flammable gas. It falls between propane and butane in its, uh, in its flammability, um, in its vapor compression cycle. It's actually a potential organic Rankine cycle uh, gas. It was the first commercial uh, uh, refrigeration gas actually ever used. Before that, liquids had been used, but it was the first gas to be used that way. It's produced on the paint car scale. It costs in terms of mass, similar to gasoline costs, it actually dips below gasoline every once in a while. Standard energy content is slightly lower, but it's about as cheap and organic as you can get. Uh, there's very good industrial ways to handle it. Um, it's approved for food processing in Europe and processing of animal feed in the United States. It's, it's And it's, again, very easy to get rid of um, in, on an industrial scale, but... 
Um, but as with anything, you don't want to work with a flammable gas in a, in inside in a non-ventilated environment. And so a C1D1 room provides you with a, it's basically a giant hood. It supplies you a ventilated environment. If once deployed commercially, this would probably be a lot like a refinery where to optimize the ventilation, they actually build these things outside instead of enclosing them within buildings. So, but this is this is our facility, and we're basically this room was built uh, with um, fifteen foot tall ceilings, eighteen foot tall ceilings, uh, with the intention of us to be able to build tall columns for our, our um, for our liquid liquid contactors and liquid liquid separators. Um, and I believe this is my last slide. And, and this is kind of a vision for the future. And what DME, DME driven separations are highly atom efficient separators, separation. So there's no extra material being added into uh, the process. And, and so there's nothing to take out of or dispose of. And so we can imagine this being combined with in situ mining where we're taking uh, fracking technology and taking it from soft rock and applying it to hard rock to engineer ore bodies, uh, taking this from an, our, our enhanced geothermal efforts, fractioning up ore bodies, doing leaching underground, potentially in less rich ore bodies because of, of advantages in terms of not having to move the ore itself and then pulling this out of the ground, much like we do in oil hyd hydrocarbon recovery, and then pulling the solids directly out of that solution. And, and so that's where DME would fit into it, and high-end uh, extraction technology or leaching technology would also have to go into this. But this is a vision. And this is something uh, that might be easier to cite within the United States than a pit mine would be and it might allow the United States to get back into mining in a way that is challenging for the current paradigm. Um, because at the end of the day, we do a lot of fracking in the in, in the United States and we do a lot of oil recovery. And the footprint of this type of process would be very very similar to those processes. And uh so for domestic pr production of minerals, I think this is a, a good avenue. And oftentimes I put my thank yous at the beginning of this slide deck, but a lot of people made this work possible. Uh, Caleb, Hian, Chris, Ikana, Dennis, and Ashini were all participants on the R&D 100 application and the award. And uh, I would like to thank them all. Like it, the collaboration between Ames and INL on this is a very, it's one of the wonderful things about the critical mineral innovation hub and, and the type of collaborations it creates. And with that, I will uh, end and uh, take any questions that there are out there. Aaron, first, I'd like to thank you for such an exceptional presentation. Um, it was just really interesting to see um, all the work that your team has been doing, and a large team there for sure, uh, on mineral recovery in the blue economy, and 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 to really understand all the way toward the end why this was an R and D one hundred award. Uh, the importance of the critical materials that you're recovering uh, with low energy is and environmentally sound you know, is, is again, just uh, remarkable. And of course, the work that CMI wants to be engaged in. Um, I think the bonus was when also you uh, talked about a few hints on uh, what to think about in an R&D 100 award application. Uh, that was a bonus for all of us on, on online for sure. And your sharing of where you've been in your research, where you're going, and really the vision for the future. So again, thank you for those gems. And uh, we do have, uh, we're opening up for questions at this point. So uh, get on those uh, questions, folks. And we do have one ready right now, if you want to move forward with that, Aaron. Oh, so the first question is, I have a question here about a uh, major fire hazard. And uh, and hope, and, it, and um, this was, uh, I think I answered this question midway, just a few minutes after the, the question was put out there. But one thing is I'd point out that um, it, dimethyl ether, its behavior is between propane and butane. 
and uh, we use propane uh, regularly on the holidays to cook our our, our meat. Uh, and so I think we there the industrial processes to handle it are there in place in many places that would consider using uh, dimethyl ether. So I think it's a great point. I think, uh, and and I'm glad it was put here because if I had missed that, this would have been a question that would have been need, needed addressing and would have been an omission. Or anything. Yeah, long, long answer. Um, is uh, another question is what rate of extraction can you achieve? And so, um, so, and which is important for adoption. And um, and so the the rate, so this this really gets into because any rate really needs to be normalized over uh, the system's footprint one way or another. So like if I can do it, uh, if I can do like a process a ton of material every hour, if I can do that in one square foot versus an acre, it's a huge difference. And so the the answer to this question is complex. But ultimately, I think the rate is going to come down to crystallization. That's going to be the mass action, mass uh, mass transfer process that is going to drive uh, the rate at which this happens. Um, there are a variety of ways to improve uh, the rate of crystallization. Um, and but we've seen it in many different ways in our system. We've had systems where uh, we had cobalt sulfate in our system. We threw DME in it, and it, the system clogged and completely crystallized in about five minutes. Uh, we have other systems where materials are more dilute, and we're seeing that we need to spend two hours to reach full equilibrium. Um, whether it, it, there are ways to optimize that as well. But the, the, those are kind of extremes in terms of the crystallization process that we're talking about. The DME goes into solution quickly and comes out of solution quickly. So those aren't the rate limiting stuff. It is the crystallization process. And uh, and it's something that is, is, um, is, I think this is another very important question. And for the desalination example, how do you selectively extract magnesium over calcium and, and sodium? Another really great question. And so the, our selectivity is determined by a number of things. The solubility of the mineral that we're producing, which is not necessarily a uh, pure mineral. So uh, there are a variety of magnesium, calcium, and sodium mixed minerals. So we can produce a mixed mineral. Um, but this is, again, uh, the work on fractional crystallization uh, is also very well established. And so it, it, it follows the rules of kind of evaporites. So the solution you're starting from matters and the solubility of the materials that can come out of it matter. And in kind of ancient lake beds that started out with one mixture of salts in them, you see layering of salts as they evaporated away. And you can see this in the geological record. And you can see this in the operation of folks like US Magnesium and compass minerals on the Great Salt Lake today and other places all around the world. So uh, we're following the similar rules. There's actually a, 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 a paper out of Cargill from I think the, the 60s or 50s by authors named Joy and Payne, greatest author, uh, author byline ever, Joy and Payne. Um, and, and they kind of lay out some of the rules on how to take um, a mixed solution with known separation factors into pure products. It's it's so so um, yeah, that's what we're working with. And um, and one of the exciting things that we found was we get higher recoveries. Anyways, um, so those were those were a couple of really great great questions. And we have some time you. for another question. Oh, here we go. Yes. Oh, another really good question that I failed to answer. What is the impact on nature if, if DME is exposed? Okay, so the greenhouse effect of methane is bad. It's long-lived, and it's a bad greenhouse gas. Uh, the half-life of dimethyl ether in the environment with that oxygen-carbon bond is measured in hours. So it degrades extremely rapidly down to uh, carbon dioxide and water. So its greenhouse impact is minimal. 
In terms of its health hazards or tox environmental toxicity, it's actually really low. So it's been used as a uh, an anesthetic, anesthesia, an anesthetic. It's actually pretty mild in terms of its immediate toxicity, and um, chronic cr chronic ex is expected to be minimal. And any way it was pumped into the environment, it would quickly partition into the atmosphere, at which point it would break down. So, um, so yeah. So, and we also that's those are the worst case scenarios. But in the best case scenario, uh, we get it out, we re and recycle it because we actually want to recycle it because it's an expense um, if you are throwing it away uh, to the environment. So. Yeah. No. Thank you for the question. Like I said, I knew I'd I knew I'd admit something. I I should I should get a slide together that just has the all, the challenges of dimethyl ether because they're non-trivial. Um, and this has inspired me to make sure I'll have that very early in my slide deck. Uh, so um, we do have a little bit more time. Does anybody else have a question? And while we're waiting for a question, um, do you have any com additional comments that you'd like to make as well, Aaron? Uh, I, I I can definitely. There's the Critical Materials Institute is uh, has been the best consortia that I've been able to work with um, within the DOE system. Uh, it it. It's a really great opportunity to um, like truly work on solving a problem um, rather than and and it provides flexibility in terms of partnering because it's a lot it, the consortia has people within it and it's also open to bringing more people more industrial pro partners and pro with problems into the consortia. It's a very straightforward uh, easy process of discussing it with the critical materials. Um, innovation um, hub leadership uh, to see if it falls within our 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 targets and our interests and our domain, and it allows us to try our technologies with a variety of partners, which was a really important factor in the success of this project. Um, one thing I did not talk about was uh, the dimethyl ether. So we were we were involved with CMI for three years prior to in the in the last ten year iteration of CMI prior to us going forward into the next five years. And what we found in that effort was there are limitations on the dimethyl ether processes in terms of what they can do in terms of fracture, fracturally crystallizing material and, um, and what we're working on in the next five years or the next iteration is solving that question. But we were able to find where it is successful by collaborating with AIMS and their industrial partner as we had looked at other materials where it has great challenges. And so that was that was a real key for us to be able to look at a variety of things to find out where our strength was and move forward with that while we learn how to address our, our weaknesses. So yeah, no, it, uh, yeah. All right, thank you so much, uh, even for the parting words there. Uh, again, everybody, we want to thank you for attending. This recording is going to be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI, and also on the YouTube channel of Critical Materials Innovation Hub. Next we webinar on cerium gap magnets will be presented by Andrew uh, Pasalyuk from Ames National Lab on March 12th. Uh, so you'll hear more about that in the Critical Times and in the newsletter. And again, if you have suggestions for a future webinar uh, for our CMI team, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. And you can contact us at CMI at ames.edu. Thank you so much for your attendance for the presentation, uh, Dr. Wilson. And we look forward to seeing everybody next month.